Good evening and welcome, everyone. Very pleased, indeed, to be able this evening to recognize uh, Norman Zinberg, the memory of his, of his uh, achievements, uh, professor of psychiatry at Harvard, uh, extraordinary pioneer in fields that are not difficult, are not, not, um, not easy by any means to make major contributions to, friend of many people, um, and uh, special friend of the senator who's with us tonight. As you know, a fellowship has been established in memory of Norman Zinberg, and this lecture tonight is the first of a lecture, annual lecture series that will honor his memory. It's a real privilege for me to introduce the senator who doesn't really, as we always say, need any introduction. It's a little bit like trying to introduce the Encyclopedia Britannica to you. Volumes and volumes of materials, not any obviously easy way to get a handle on it. First, there is the official public persona uh, that we all know. He has to be regarded by any standards as one of the significant public servants and public good stewards of the last few decades, defender of our democratic institutions. He's been a member of the Senate from New York since 1976, constantly reelected with larger and larger, if there could be larger, pluralities every successive time. He sits on many committees, more than I can name, but, uh, and I'll have to read these because he is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Social Security and Family Policy of the Committee on Finance. And he is also the chairman of the Subcommittee on Water Resources, Transportation and Infrastructure on Environment and Public Works. And he is, as we all know, about to become the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. He's the only person, I think, as far as the statistics show, who's been a cabinet or sub-cabinet official in four successive
future at this time when there are so many poor. The other thing we should not leave unsaid uh, is the fact that it comes someone who doesn't have those pretensions, who in fact has great wit, great charm. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, if your morals make you dreary, depend upon it, they are wrong. And whose morals do not make him dreary, do not make the rest of us dreary, make us believe, in fact, that morality and social commitment can be allied with wit and zest and humor and great vivacity. Senator Moynihan. <laughs> Mr. President and Dorothy, and, and friends, there's so many here. Um, Samuel Johnson also once remarked that <clears throat> in lapidary, in, in lapidary uh, orations, one is not upon oath. Uh, and, and, and I would like to note that when I say that this is, of course, the first inaugural lecture of the, the first inorm, uh, the inaugural Norman E. Zinberg lecture. Uh, but what I'm about to tell you is the truth. Uh, and I hope the, um, uh, the evidence uh, emerges uh, uh, from uh, the text itself. Um, in the um, <clears throat> writing in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1983, Armand uh, Nicoli of the uh, Department of Psychiatry of the Massachusetts General Hospital and at the Harvard Medical School um, commented, when future historians study American culture, they may be most perplexed by the explosive increase in the non-medical use of drugs that occurred during the seventh and eighth decades of this century. Uh, this widespread increase in the illicit use of psychoactive drugs in colleges and universities during an era of unprecedented uh, took place during an era of unprecedented campus disorder and social upheaval. For the next 10 years, studies were focused on patterns of drug use among college students, the late adolescent and young adult age groups. Uh, perhaps because of the strong influence youth exerts in establishing the tone of our culture with respect to music, address, lifestyle, the non-medical use of drugs spread rapidly to other age groups, and during the 1970s, it reached epidemic uh, proportions. When these future historians set to work, one matter need not perplex them. If, if they should ask, and let us hope they do, did anyone in the medical profession, observing the onset of this epidemic, set out in a scientific manner to try to understand what was happening and to develop an appropriate medical response, the answer will be that there was one such person, Norman Zinberg, professor of psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. He was in the most profound sense a healer, a life-enhancing, loving, caring person, and hence also a man of mirth and merriment. Blessed are those who have shared an evening at his and Dorothy's home on Scott Street on occasions that uh, Tom Lehrer would conduct his own soaring composition, the Norman Zinberg Cantata, <laughs> with its thundering onset Norman Zinberg, intrepider than Lindbergh, we sing this song to you. Uh, although his major work, Drug Set and Setting, was not published until 1984, his papers and lectures were well and widely known by the mid-1960s. At that time, I became director of the Joint Center for Urban Studies 
at MIT and Harvard. We were neighbors, we became friends, and in the course of this, I became, in a legitimate sense, a pupil. In 1969, I went to Washington as an advisor on urban affairs to President uh, Nixon. Um, the urban crisis, as it was then known, was very much a drug crisis, in this case, heroin. Early on, it, it fell to me to try to fashion a response by the federal government. <clears throat> and this was perhaps the first time in, uh, in the history of federal uh, policy uh, that there has been a deliberate relationship between uh, that policy and drug research. Uh, this was the subject of the final chapter in Drug Set and Setting, uh, to its social policy and drug research, and I have taken it for the title of this inaugural lecture. Uh, my first initiative came in August 1969, after the President had sent to Congress a, a considerable legislative program addressed to urban uh, matters. The welfare system was to be replaced by a guaranteed income. The federal government would share its revenue with state and city governments, and such like measures. Um, that bespeak the combination of social anxiety and fiscal ease of that now distant period. Um, now was the time for drugs. At that time, most of the heroin used here was coming in from Marseille, where it uh, had been refined from to Turkish opium. <clears throat> I immediately set out for those countries to tell their officials and our embassies that the United States could no longer accept this. In the, uh, the 1985 Godkin Lectures here at the uh, Kennedy School, I've described these adventures, and including the key to our, our relative easy uh, success, uh, namely a scattering of heroin-related deaths among French youths, an article in Le Monde describing drug addiction to broken homes, and a subsequent day-long debate in the National Assembly. Um, the French took the matter far more seriously than we had ever done, and before long, Marseille would be clean, as usage has it. Um, I've not, however, un until now, related a personal aftermath. Um, uh, uh, tentative agreements having been reached, I found myself in a helicopter flying to Camp David to report on this seeming success. Uh, the only other passenger was George P. Schultz, who was busy with uh, official-looking papers. Uh, even so, I related our triumph. He looked up, said, good, and returned to his tables and charts. Uh, no, no, really, I said, this is a big event. And my cabinet colleague looked up and restated a now perfunctory good, and once more returned to his paperwork. Um, crestfallen, I pondered, then said, <clears throat> I suppose you think that as long as there is a demand, there will continue to be a supply? <laughs> Whereupon the sometime professor of economics at the University of Chicago looked up this time with an air of genuine interest, and said, you know, there's hope for you yet. <laughs> and uh, in, indeed there was for, for me individually and um, for the federal government, as it once again engaged itself with this issue, uh, which had been latent since, say, the second decade of the century. Uh, Early in December 1969, a governor's conference was convened to address the issue, and at a luncheon at the State Department, um, I was the, the principal speaker. I don't suggest that my views were held uniformly uh, throughout the administration, but there I was, a counselor to the president, telling the governors what I thought, which they had reason to believe was close to what others like me thought. The point in either event <clears throat> is that we were mostly asserting what we did not know and would need to learn. I called my paper <clears throat> The Whiskey Culture and the Drug Culture. And I had a simple theme. 
I said, <clears throat> let me, I'm quoting, let me offer one general idea. Drug use and abuse represents simply one more instance of the impact of technology on society. Uh, this is the central experience of modern society. At one or two removes, most of the ills we suffer are the consequences of technology. That is to say, the bad results that accompany the good uh, ones, uh, good results which led to the adoption of the technology in the first place. A commonplace observation, but truly an important one, in which will, I think, be recognized by governors who struggle daily with waters polluted by technology, underprivileged populations displaced by technology, drivers and pe pedestrians maimed uh, by technology, air fouled by it. Not to mention urban populations near to terrorized by crime brought about by the need to obtain money to purchase certain drugs, which are yet another product of technology. Uh, from nuclear weapons to cyclamates, this is what is so unsettling about modern life. The effort to master and somehow transcend technology is central to the concerns of great philosophical historians and sociologists of the age, men such as Jacques Ellul, uh, Louis Mumford, David Reisman, uh, Michael Young. But for the moment, one of the tasks of government is to keep technology from rending the fabric of society. That is what this conference is about, the specifics of which I would now like to consider. <clears throat> I, I discussed in, um, in some detail the extraordinary destructiveness of a distilled alcohol when it first became available in the 18th century as a result of the, as a combined result of the Renaissance invention of distillation and uh, the later agricultural revolution that produced an abundance uh, of grain. And in the distinguished presence of, uh, of Professor Galbraith, I must acknowledge that the, uh, the Scots seemed always to have known about distillation, but they are a singularly um, um, talented person. People <laughs> are, <laughs> the, um, <coughs> uh, the, the species had no experience with an intoxicant of this power. Um, in his, his study, Town Planning in London, the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, David uh, Donald Olson identifies the onset of distilled spirits uh, as a form of social pathology. Uh, I quote, cheap gin helped to keep the population of London stable from 1700 to 1750. Um, in, in truth, the numbers are astonishing. Uh, uh, Bauer estimates that the population I I at 1700 had uh, to have been six, 600,000, 674,000, and 50 years later, no more than 676,000, um, a flat population over half a century. By contrast, now get this, because it explains a lot of social history, um, the population of London went from 864,845 in the first British census of 1801 to 2,363,236 50 years later in 1851. Uh, now, ought we not to think that a form of social learning was taking place? Uh, because this was at a period of robust uh, laissez-faire government. The government wasn't teaching anybody anything. Uh, but they were getting smarter about something. Uh, and uh, they got so much smarter that they, um, uh, uh, things were so much better, the next thing you know, we were talking about the teeming slums of London, uh, uh, which where the population more than doubled in, uh, almost tripled, almost tripled in 50 years. Um, um, Rohrbach's, uh, Rohrbach's The Alcoholic Republic, an American tradition, would not appear for another decade, but um, enough of the experience was available um, uh, that I could uh, write about it um, uh, at this time, talk about it, with the particular twist in the early American history uh, that the, the only available uh, way, the only effective way to bring grain from the interior to the seacoast uh, uh, was as whiskey. Uh, it became a political as well as an economic question uh, what with the, the French in New Orleans, where the Ohio Mississippi uh, uh, Valley uh, uh, outlet. Um, um, I, I once asked just an, 
fit of curiosity, um, what was the first law enacted by the first Congress? Um, and sure enough, as you would like to think, uh, it, was, it established the oath of office, uh, which is required by Article VI of the Constitution. And the oath reads, I, A.B., uh, do solemnly swear or affirm, as the case may be, that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That was the first law. The second law imposed a 10 cent a gallon tariff on Jamaica rum <laughs> uh, to encourage the consumption of the American product. Uh, this was a general tariff bill, but of the, uh, of the first six items, uh, five are to that effect. On all distilled spirits of Jamaica proof imported from any kingdom or country whatsoever per gallon 10 cents. On all other distilled spirits per gallon 8 cents. On Madeira wine per gallon 18 cents. Another one, on a gallon of beer, ale, porter, cider beer, ale, porter, and goes, on it goes. Um, uh, distilled spirits appeared as a font of national unity, easy money, manly strength, and all round good cheer. Uh, it was at first irresistible. Uh, it felt good and was thought to be good for you, and the more the better. Uh, it became routine to drink whiskey at breakfast uh, and to go on drinking all day. Uh, laborers on the Erie Canal uh, were uh, allotted a quart of Monongahela whiskey a day and issued in eight four ounce portions, beginning commencing at six o'clock in the morning. Um, only slowly did it sink in that such a regimen was ruinous to health and a risk to society. When it did, society responded. Uh, apart, from the, apart only from the movement to abolish slavery, the most, po most popular and influential social movement of the 19th century uh, concerned the effort to limit or indeed prohibit the use of alcohol. alcohol. Uh, the, the former brought about three amendments to the Constitution, the latter two. Uh, in his thinking about crime, uh, 1983, James Q. Wilson, sometime of the Harvard Department of Government, estimates that by the end of the 19th century, the temperance movement had reduced per capita alcohol consumption by two thirds in the United States. Um, alcohol continues to be a major, uh, alcohol abuse continues to be a major health problem and a murderous one in combination with that other technological wonder, the automobile, but at least the dangers are far better understood than in the past. The use of what might be termed high-proof drugs appears roughly a century later than the use of high-proof alcoholic drink. Um, and just as beer and wine are naturally fermented products of, of grain and grapes and universal in cultures, um, uh, narcotics and stimulants appear in nature as attributes of the poppy or the cocoa plant, and, and there are others. Um, then in the first half of the 19th century, morphine was produced from opium. In combination with the hypodermic needle, it was widely used in, uh, the Civil War, in Civil War medicine, giving rise to a form of addiction that was popularly called soldier's disease. Uh, the medical use of, of morphine in childbirth evidently led to forms of, uh, similar forms of addiction. A generation later, a, a heroin, a distillation of morphine was developed. Uh, when tested on employees at the Bayer uh, pharmaceutical firm in, Ge in, in Germany, it made them feel heroic, uh, and hence uh, heroin. Uh, and you can find advertisements for heroin in the Yale Alumni Journal then, uh, 1910. 19, uh, uh, um, and um, in, uh, uh, and it appears that uh, heroin was thought useful uh, as a cure for morphine. Um, in, there was. There was they, people dealing with something they hadn't seen before. Um, in, in like manner, cocaine, the active ingredient of the coca leaf, was isolated before 1880. Its early use was medical, again, in association with the hypodermic needle. Uh, Freud used it to treat a friend suffering from morphine addiction. His first publication it is Uber Cocaine. Um, as he increased the doses, he induced an episode of cocaine psychosis and as reported by Ray in 1978, thereafter was bitterly against drugs. Well, that's a quote. On the other hand, in 1885, the, the Park Davis Pharmaceutical Company asserted that cocaine, I quote, can supply the place of food 
make the coward brave, the silent eloquent, and declared it to be a wonder drug. Um, uh, along with alcohol, these substances came under federal prohibition early in this century. Uh, alcohol uh, prohibition was a convulsive event, uh, which among other things led to the creation of a, a criminal underworld of exceptional influence and durability. It endures to this day. Um, there was always a certain amount of drug trafficking within this underworld, and this continued at modest levels until the epidemic outbreak of heroin use in the 1960s. It thereupon provided a model, the prohibition model, on which the large-scale import and distribution of drugs commenced in the 1960s. Um, Rereading my little noticed and, and long forgotten paper is rewarding to me uh, if, uh, in, in that it, it, reveals the, the, it reveals the incompatibilities, the, the iron incompatibilities that beset anyone who tries, however tentatively, to derive drug policy from drug research, and for that matter, uh, social science. Here I, I would invoke the, the wonderfully elusive uh, remark of Rudolf Virchow, uh, the eminent 19th century uh, pathologist, uh, who once said, medicine is social science, and politics is nothing but medicine on a grand scale. Uh, in a word, as I developed this far, first this argument, then that analogy, I kept running up against the fact that our society has made a political choice between two almost equally undesirable outcomes. As, as Mark Kleiman uh, spells out in his fine new study, Against Excess, Drug Policy for Results, it's in, published here at the Kennedy School, uh, <clears throat> we are required to choose between a crime problem and a public health problem. Um, in, in opting for prohibition, we choose to have an increasingly general crime problem rather than a general health problem. Um, he, he writes, and I quote, the case for heroin prohibition is simply that a number, probably a large number of persons who now lead reasonably satisfying, dignified, and useful lives would, if heroin were legal, find themselves leading and regretting lives with a narrowed range of satisfaction, impaired dignity and self-command, and reduced usefulness to their families, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and fellow citizens. <laughs> to prevent this, we pay a price in the form of increased misery for those who become heavy heroin users despite prohibition and increased external costs. The spread of disease, user crime, black market crime, neighborhood disruption from open dealing and the expenditure of law enforcement resources that could instead be used to suppress uh, predatory crime. Um, I was clear then, and I am now, that I, that I opposed a legalization or decriminalization. Uh, I, I took the technological ascent seriously. Um, in his letters from an American farmer, uh, uh, de Crevecourt, uh, in 1782, uh, notes his surprise at the singular custom, as he put it, among the good and presumably Puritan ladies of Nantucket. He writes, they have adopted these many years the Asiatic custom of taking a dose of opium every morning. Uh, this is much more prevalent among the women <coughs> than the men. Well, <coughs> opium is one thing, Heroin is another. Uh, and so I summed up in that paper, there are those who will and do propose a social policy of complete and free availability of almost all chemical substances that are or can be ingested in one form or another. In its most popular form today, this takes the form of advocating the free use of cannabis and somewhat less frequently the free or mildly regulated use of heroin. I believe this to be a very mistaken policy. It is a form of hiding behind the principle of individual freedom to avoid the reality of individual danger and individual harm. It is almost a form of indifference to pain, and I say that in full knowledge of the generosity of spirit and the effort to be understanding that often motivates such proposals. Our object must, by, must be higher. 
we must learn to use few, fewer drugs, not more. The question, of course, is how? Um, um, that was pretty clear 23 years ago, um, that we were, we were just beginning to enter a, uh, uh, the current preoccupation with illicit drugs. Um, and I put it to the federal government <coughs> that there's something more was involved. I said, we have now had drug prohibition, I put it to the governors, that something more was involved. We've now had drug prohibition for 55 years. And here we are at this conference, not exactly a, ref a record of success. What are we to learn? Obviously, it, the first thing obviously is that this is not an easy problem. Men as good as us or better have struggled, and the all out, to all out, by all outward indices they have failed. I said, this goes beyond <coughs> just the questions of individuals and their behavior. Uh, what we're dealing with is a question of the, and I quote, the structure and authority of governmental legitimacy in America. That if you pass a law, you can enforce. And in consequence of the law, violence and crime become rampant and uh, everywhere uh, a matter of preoccupation. Uh, uh, you're not governing. And when you stop governing, then you are really in deep problems. Which is where Norman Zinberg entered what at least were my calculations. Uh, let me read one last passage from that State Department address. It's 1969 uh, 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 now. <clears throat> Dr. Norman Zinberg has, it seems to me, uh, most helpfully described the drug phenomenon in terms of a triangle of drug, set, and setting. That is to say, we need to know so much more about the interaction of a particular chemical, a particular individual, and the social or antisocial context in which the two come together. This is very like the epidemiological triad um, and deserves the most careful attention and serious research. Until very recently, most drug users have been treated in terms of medical or criminal categories. Drug users were treated as deviants, benignly so in the case of civil war, uh, uh, opium addicts, or punitively so as in the case of heroin, the heroin addict of the slum. Um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the time to address this differently was at hand. And Norman Zinberg had set it out. Now, a quarter century has passed, and nothing has happened, uh, by which I mean there has been precious little research with as yet precious little, by the way, of result on that epidemiological triad. Uh, thanks to Vincent Dole and Marie Neiswander, we have methadone treatment. Uh, we had that already. Uh, and methadone was, after all, de developed in Germany in World War II. Um, the, um, uh, uh, at, at the risk of propounding what I cannot prove, let me suggest that in considerable measure, this nothing is the result of a disinclination within the medical profession to engage itself with this subject. Uh, in his preface to Drug Set and Setting, uh, published in 1984, uh, Zinberg notes the, the train of thought that led him to his subject. Uh, it began in 1962 in Beth Israel Hospital across the river where, making rounds with non-psychiatric physicians, he, and I quote, began to puzzle over the extreme reluctance these sensible physicians feel, felt about prescribing doses of opiates to relieve pain. Concern about iatrogenic addiction established the social setting which he would go on to elaborate. He noted the, the strength of Puritan moralism in American culture, which frowns on the pleasure and recreation provided by intoxicants. Whatever the causes, and they're surely multiple, it is clear to, to him, uh, clear to, I'm sorry, to, to this observer, that the medical profession finds drug research somehow aversive behavior. Uh, take, take as an example our most recent affliction, crack cocaine. This prototypical ascent of the technological ladder um, uh, began, uh, uh, it, it took place in, in the Bahamas, uh, but uh, as, a, uh, as a folk 
science. All the other stuff was done by bearded uh, professors in German laboratories, but this was done in, in a kitchen somewhere in Kingston. Uh, uh, by 1985, a Bahamian physician um, uh, trained here at Harvard um, uh, warned that an epidemic was about to strike us from his offshore islands. This is an item in the Atlanta Journal, December 31, 1985. Nassau, Bahamas. A highly addictive practice of smoking cocaine rocks has swept this chain of islands off the coast of Florida. In a country of 230,000 people, the number of cocaine users treated in, at mental health clinics has zoomed from zero in 1982 to 209 in 1984. David Allen, a Harvard-trained psychiatrist who heads the National Drug Council. And Allen is quoted, uh, what we have is the world's first free basing epidemic which could be preceding an epidemic in the industrialized United States. Anywhere there is readily available high-quality cocaine, there is that potential. And what did the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta do about this? Nothing. No one thing. Uh, there had been in 19, in, uh, there had been a single sentence in a 1982 issue of the weekly uh, morbidity and mortality of the of the morbidity and mortality weekly report. Uh, there was a single sentence, nothing more. Uh, the first article in uh, on this subject, which has devastated our cities, um, uh, appeared in the Lancet, published in London in 1986, an article by Allen and others uh, entitled um, the. Uh, epidemic free base cocaine abuse case study from the Bahamas. Uh, I learned about crack cocaine from a, a New York detective who one about this time, about 86, said to me, you know, there are guys standing around the corner going like this, and we don't know what the hell they're doing. And uh, then about two months later, he said, they, they got something called crack, they're cracking a whip. Uh, cops figured it out. The doctors didn't. Uh, and uh, so th this was the situation in which Congress returned to the subject of drugs in 1988. We crack really got hold of us. Uh, uh, so society had two bad breaks during that decade, the sudden onset of AIDS and of crack in set settings of lethal proximity. Uh, the public demanded action, or at least the appearance of action, uh, and on May uh, 17, uh, 1988, the majority leader, Robert Byrd, established a working group uh, on substance abuse to be co-chaired by my, d my distinguished uh, colleague, the uh, chairman of, th of the Armed Services Committee, uh, Senator Nunn of Georgia, and by me as chairman of the Subcommittee on Social Security and Family Policy. Uh, interdiction and crackdown was all the rage. Um, even as we were working on a very compressed schedule, uh, the the, the Congress passed and sent to the President a law invoking the death penalty for kingpins. Uh, uh, the Senate passed uh, a two to one, a, a law, uh, this was for kingpins who had been involved in a murder. The Senate passed two to one, a, uh, a, a death penalty for kingpins who hadn't been involved in anything but being kingpins. Um, and uh, that's all right, it's kingpins for a day. They don't, you know, if you look for kingpins, they don't last long on those streets. Um, but um, in, uh, in our work, um, and as I will say, in consultation with Norman, um, we decided that, um, I mean, I, my job was to make it clear to my colleagues that uh, without trying to disturb the public peace, that interdiction was not going to have the slightest effect on supply, save for the possible effect of raising prices somewhat. If you'd like to know about a about one quarter of the uh, amount uh, shipped in the country is seized. And if you seize more, the amount shipped in would go increase. The, um, most of the uh, marijuana in this country is grown in the national forests, if you'd like to know that. Uh, the amount of cocaine uh, uh, that we use in this country uh, could, be, could be grown uh, in an area about the size of Boston and Cambridge. You have to find that in, Latin, in South America. Uh, it's, it's not that hard. But, um, um, and so, I mean, that was the lesson taught me by uh, George Schultz. Um, accordingly, any comprehensive legislation would have to have at least equal emphasis on demand. The lesson taught me by Norman Zinberg. The idea 
that controlled use was possible, even common, led directly to the proposition that treatment could be developed that could move drug users across the line towards abstinence or as near as made no matter. Uh, I consulted uh, Zinberg. I asked to be coached on how to make this case. Um, and in the end, it worked. The, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988 became law, November 18 of that year, um, uh, with a, uh, after a, a, com a compressed schedule, ending with a 65-29 vote in the Senate. And Section 2012 sets out purposes, and these include, and I quote, to increase to the greatest extent possible the availability and quality of treatment services so that treatment on request may be provided to all individuals desiring to rid themselves of their substance abuse problem. The legislation established in the Executive Office of the President an Office of National Drug Control Policy the so-called czar, the first time, uh, along with a deputy director for supply and a deputy director for demand. Uh, when Norman uh, died uh, the following spring, his obituary included a statement by me that enacting this multi-billion dollar legislation, first of its kind to give formal recognition to drug treatment, I quote, to a singular degree, we acted on the advice of Norman Zinberg. And so it began again, sort of. Um, a line of, of Eliot comes to mind. Again, nothing. Uh, and yet, this won't quite do. Uh, Herbert uh, Kleber, then at Yale, now a professor of psychiatry at uh, Columbia, was persuaded to accept the post of deputy director for demand. And thus, for the first time, a scientist concerned with treatment was high in the hierarchy of the drug, federal drug program. A work began, uh, or accelerated, on developing a cocaine blocker or an anti-craving compound with what might be control, a controlled, what might be called a controlled expectation for medication as drug therapy. But it was understood, and I would propose that this is the great legacy of Norman Zinberg, that the primary job of drug treatment is to change behavior, and that behavior can be changed. Now, having said that, a political scientist is honor bound to state also that the power of government to influence this outcome is accordingly limited indeed. Uh, people do or do not get on with their lives, and most do. Things that before Zinberg wrote were not thought possible are now, are now known about uh, and indeed are possible. In a few weeks we will have the autobiography, Tales Out of School, of, the present, uh, uh, of Joseph Fernandez, the present uh, uh, New York City uh, school chancellor, uh, describing his years as a, what we would call a drug addict, a heroin addict. Uh, uh, the, the beginning of my own fateful turnabout came in one night of horror in 135th Street and, and uh, describing his life as, as almost passing out, almost going under uh, an overdose of heroin. Um, and then, uh, then something worked. Uh, he got in the Air Force. Uh, he got an education. He got a, a good wife. Uh, uh, he, he got his life together. And uh, his setting changed. Uh, and and, and it, uh, it, uh, it, it, that, again, that is something we can talk about and know about from Zinberg. Um, as for our 1988 legislation, it had a brief half-life. William Bennett, the forceful first director, was followed by a political appointee who, with no apparent views on the subject, uh, Dr. Kleber, um, left after two years, and his position has not been filled. Um, and as, as Dr. Kleber will say, uh, funding for treatment of substance abuse has been a bipartisan failure. Uh, a Republican president, I'm quoting him, has requested substantially less money than is needed, and the Democratic Congress gave him only one-third of what he asked for. Uh, it, it, it still hasn't made its case. Uh, the recent presidential campaign was only marginally encouraging. Uh, the Republican platform was straight out. It ignored treatment altogether uh, and comes out for frying those kingpins. Uh, 
Uh, we oppose legalizing or decriminalizing drugs. This is a morally abhorrent idea, the last vestige of an ill-conceived philosophy at Harvard University. No, it doesn't say it. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that counsel the legitimacy of permissiveness, uh, similarly dysfunctional morality explains away no excuse, human life, what stiffest penalties, including death penalty for major drug traffickers and so forth. Uh, the democratic position was more forthcoming, a calling for treatment on demand. Although I will admit to a mild disappointment that no one seems to know that we, we enacted that in 1988. Uh, I, 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 I used the term treatment on request, as it seemed to me demand was a little, little imperious for uh, the, these people. Um, but the, uh, the Democrats won, and we shall see. Um, my hope is that it will be possible for the generation now, the generation, listen to me because I'm not finished, because uh, I realize I, I, I'm saying something better than I, I knew. It's my hope that the generation now coming into its own in the normal rhythm of generational change and taking responsibility in government. Uh, we'll be able to recall that drug use, as Dr. Nicoli records, first became conspicuous in this cycle among educated and relatively affluent persons on college campuses. Now, it is no longer. Uh, such persons learn to, you know, not for nothing are they educated and affluent. They learn to behave. They say, no, that does not, it's not good for breakfast, it's not, you know, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and such like. Uh, but that that, that drug abuse, in its most notably destructive form, is not concentrated over there in the square anymore. It's concentrated um, over in Roxbury, uh, in, the most, in the weakest and least affluent segments of our population. Uh, it is inescapably associated with race, as Zinberg uh, recorded, noted, citing a musto, musto at, at Yale. Um, here's some devastating numbers. In 1960, there were 189,000 persons in state prisons, 65% white, 34% black. 30 years later, there are 610,000 persons in state prisons, 50% black. Uh, the population of federal prisons where there are fewer drug offenses has not changed in numbers nor in, in, in racial composition. It was 71-25 in 60, it's 73-26 today. Now, there has got to come about a more general understanding that by choosing prohibition, we are choosing to have a crime problem that is concentrated among minorities. It is no different from the prohibition of the 1920s. Al Capone and Legs Diamond were recognizable urban ghetto types of that era. Much of the crime is the same order. Uh, uh, extra legal crime enforcing contracts in an extra legal situation. The, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929 has two entries in the World uh, a Book Encyclopedia. Uh, nine people were killed. Uh, uh, James Q. Wilson observes that there's a St. Valentine's Day Massacre every weekend in Los Angeles. Uh, I had one in particular, uh, they happen all the time in Manhattan, uh, the day after the Democratic Convention, uh, reading in but way back in the paper, it wasn't very important, um, an apartment in the Bronx where uh, three people had been found shot once in the back of the head, duct tape, all that, a teenager, a, a man, a woman, and the woman had somehow tucked her baby away out of sight. And the police a day later found the baby uh, dehydrated, uh, but three months old, but alive, and, uh, and that went off to, you know, to a hospital routine. Um, it, it must not be allowed to stay such. Uh, we, w we must recognize that what our choice of policy, legalization or prohibition, involves in inevitable outcomes. To say once last time, a massive public health problem on the one hand or a massive crime problem on the other. And the latter clearly requires more by way of public policy than the death, than the death penalty for people who kill each other in any event. In closing, uh, let me argue once again that what we call the drug problem in our society uh, is more than anything else a fallout of the extraordinary breakdown of the family structure uh, that began in the 1960s when this began. Uh, I, it is my view 
that the, the population susceptible to this kind of epidemiological onslaught oh, had to be a weakened population, and that, that in this case, family structure is the case. Uh, in the, the new Harvard Guide to Psychiatry, the Association on the Adolescent uh, is full of references. It's the, the Association of Self-Destructive Behavior Involving Psychoactive Drug Use with Absent Parents is explicitly spelled out as his, as his pregnancy out of wedlock, suicide, anti-social uh, behavior, the whole range. Um, uh, uh, it seems to me that we are dealing with, in a sense, a dependent variable here. Um, and then to go back to my theme of, of technology, I think the, the least explored aspect of the extraordinary change in family structure of the last generation uh, has been the final catching up of the, uh, the decline in the age of menarche. Uh, Tanner, who is at London, uh, uh, has, has, has traced this. Uh, menarche, has, the average age has, has been declining four months a year every decade uh, since the early 19th century. Uh, in, it was 18, in, in London, it was, eight, it was eight, 60 and 1860. It was 16.5 years. Today, it's 12.5 and, and dropping further. Uh, that seems to me to be clearly also the impact of technology, in this case, the technology of, uh, of health generally and of, of, of diet, um, which is a subject for another lecture and another lecturer. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I thank you, and I, I uh, particularly want to thank the students who are up in the in the god in, in the gods, as I used to say in, in, in Paris. And uh, uh, I, I believe the uh, program is for me to take questions, sir. Questions or and or or, or listen to um, um, no questions. Questions. All right. All right. <laughs> I've heard uh, 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 questions, and uh, there are microphones over here. About you all know the formula, uh, sir. Uh, I can't help resisting uh, uh, asking you uh, how your position on legalization lines up with the substance of your talk. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, Kleiman's view, my passage from Kleiman, you could have a choice of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> do you want a uh, 100 million people using uh, substances that really do take you know, take a, a satisfactory and uh, satisfying and productive life and turning it into a mess. Uh, it, is the, it is the judgment that that would happen. Um, it's a judgment a better, a person is better uh, able to judge than I. I mean, I, I'm, there's got to be some deference system in these things. Um, uh, that would be Herbert Kleber's view, the strongest there. Uh, that would be uh, Herb Kleiman's view. And, uh, and I sort of, between the Yale Medical School and the Harvard School of Government, I triangulate and say that's my view. Well, let me be just one step more specific. Please, please. Uh, why isn't the lesson from your background discussion with respect to alcohol something that then carries over uh, to at least lower technological forms of uh, drug abuse, that is, that people will learn <coughs> to use and not abuse, I and that uh, we'll come out with something that allows us to have a drink in the evening. Um, I, um, uh, I suspect that's the way we are trending. Um, gosh, I think if there, uh, who, who are the doctors in the audience, uh, can I ask? Uh, I mean, there's just an, uh, I mean, the amount of uh, psychoactive drugs used now is enormous, is it not? The doctor want to say no? I don't mean starting with aspirin, but I mean, you know. Well, <clears throat> the, uh, I would not say tremendous, no. And, uh, by psychoactive, you mean not, not by tremendous? By psychoactive, no. you mean psychoactive illicit drugs? No, illicit. Illicit. Uh, I, I guess I'm talking about Valium. Is it right? well, <laughs> Oh, there I'm, again, with Valium, there was much more use in the past than there is now. It goes down. It goes down. Yeah. It's, uh, 
I think the gentleman who was asking the question was pointing out that uh, that uh, societies, uh, if you look at uh, at uh, pre-industrial societies, they have all accommodated to the drugs that were available to them. And uh, there's even if you look at tobacco in this country, for example, without the benefit of prohibition, we have managed now that we are learning about it. To, uh, to behave much more uh, rationally with respect to that. And while we will never have a smoke-free society, we can hope for a society where tobacco uh, causes very little harm, and that certainly seems to be the trend. Mm -hmm. and we have not, uh, one could imagine that if, if we had pro prohibited tobacco, we might have a big criminal element connected with it. So I think there, there are other kinds of lessons to be learned from uh, I, I, would you accept my proposition that, uh, you know, you, you are placed with two undesirable choices? I would accept your proposition that there are two undesirable choices, but I don't believe that the choice you've made is the, uh, the... It's the better, it, it's the least undesirable. You, you would move in the other direction. I would be in the other direction. Well, uh, we may be, um, <coughs> we may be approaching that, but it will need a level of evidence. Uh, that we don't now have. I mean, Zorman Zinberg was a rare man. He went out and he, he studied people who used these things. And again, saying, you know, go away. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the amount, <clears throat> I'd be happy to be told that I'm wrong, that there is a, a roaring level of research in this field. Uh, I mean, I, I said earlier today, uh, earlier at dinner, that, uh, you know, there's a shelf of uh, Nobel Prizes for the people who break the AIDS code. Uh, I don't know whether anybody, uh, I mean, you, you, you skirt respectability in this field. I think that's changed, but it was not, it was the case, I think, when Norman began. I, I don't mean to make you answer, but uh, ma'am. Um, the government tries to keep. Oh, I guess we've got to alternate. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can give shorter answers, too. <laughs> In order to gain the, the attention of the medical profession, would you um, advocate um, increasing reimbursement for m m Medicaid re reimbursement for drug treatment or in inclusion of substantial um, um, benefits for, for drug treatment in a, in a future national health insurance or something else? Oh, well, the answer is, is, is yes, but you would want to know what the profession thinks. Uh, you don't get much talk. I mean, uh, you'd be surprised how isolated you are in Washington trying to <coughs> deal with this. They never come and tell you what is, is in order. Uh, you, you don't hear. There is no, the, the, the subject of the debate of the lecture was social policy and drug research. Drug research has very little impact on social policy because it doesn't, um, the researchers don't, either aren't there or don't, connect Well, do, do, do you think that may be due to, to lack of reimbursement for things that, that could, um, I mean, yield clinical research, for instance? Um, I, 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 mean, I mean, physicians won't move into clinical research that, that is relevant, it seems, and, unless they're... Oh, I, I, you, you, I agree. Um, but, you know, do you, know, you realize the, the, what, we go, what, what goes into interdiction? God almighty, you know we have an air force down in the, on the Mexican border? And, uh, and it'll never go away. Customs has an Air Force, and it's, uh, you know, it's now part of your congressional district, and, it just, and they don't do a damn thing, uh, but they love that Air Force. And, uh, <laughs> um, the government tries to keep out addictive uh, drugs in this country, and yet they will not allow the RU486 drug to come into this country, which is a, the abortion drug, the morning after drug and which would help in many, in curing many diseases, including cancer and Parkinson's disease. Could you comment on that? Well, Why this drug it, you know, it, 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 would, it would not be professional for me to say I, I know what you're talking about. I, I read about it. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how you get cancer. I don't know how you, and I don't know any of these things. Uh, this is a decision well, for the FDA. I think I can very much accept the proposition that these decisions have been politicized Definitely. in the last uh, decade, and I hope that is, uh, that, uh, that's over. <coughs> I very much hope that over, and I expect it would be, and if anybody, uh, but again, it's, it's very much a professional uh, a, a judgment, and I don't want to automatically say that this particular judgment is, is, is a political one. 
Well, it just seems, uh, Senator, that um, this drug is being kept out because of um, religious right groups in this country. Well, that, so uh, they, they did not. Uh, if that's the case, they lost the election. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> yes, I'm a uh, professor at the uh, medical school, oh, good. as well as an AIDS researcher. Oh, yes, and of uh, you asked uh, to, if anybody would tell you you were wrong, and I'm happy to stand up and tell you I don't think you were right. Good, <laughs> good, good. Um, but I do applaud your emphasis on the uh, question of uh, reducing demand. And I think that, as was the case in the early days of AIDS research, in which it was not popular to do AIDS research, nor was there a political will in the country that would support AIDS research, I think that the first step toward what you've called for is an increase in the uh, academic and medical emphasis on drug prevention and drug abuse is to generate that political will. Because where there is the political will, and certainly where there is the money, the scientists follow. You will find it very difficult for the scientists to lead because the scientists need support for their research. You mean the they're they get, just like soybean farmers? They are like soybean farmers. Damn, I didn't know that. And AIDS researchers. I'll give you, I'll give you, you should know that. You've been a professor. <laughs> that was another department. Ah, very different, I'm sure. Now, the, um, now, wait, I want you but to tell but me. Where, where, why AIDS research is a very big and booming industry in the United States booming today industry, yeah. is because there is a billion dollars a year spent by the federal government and an equal amount of money spent by drug companies. It's because we recognize that to be a critical social problem that taxpayers pay that money. And I think it's a political job, job for men like you, and job for others to create that demand in the population for the research that will surely follow the resources. Well, I um, <clears throat> uh, well, I hope you're right. But I've been on this <clears throat> case for a quarter century, right? And it keeps coming out differently than I expect. I mean, I wrote it into statute. <clears throat> and you heard you know, what's happened. Uh, I think there's a question of prestige in science here, and I'm, per I'm happy to be That's the wrong. issue I would say you were wrong, because there are people, and I'm on committees that give prizes, and we give prizes to people to encourage that kind of research. It's really, I think, a problem of funding, and you pointed it out in your talk, where you said the president asked for too little and was given even less. And that's the question of getting, not your will, which is great, but getting your will to dominate. Well, I mean, uh, Mencken used to have a little postcard he'd send out that said to people who wrote him and said, Dear sir or madam, you may be right. Uh, <laughs> I want to first thank you for your work on the demand side of the um, 88 crime package. In Boston, uh, we did put it to what I think good use, and it's made a difference. It did. So uh -huh. even There's some money, money came with it. It's little, and we need more, but it really has made a difference. So uh, thank you very much. In your remarks, you talked about the concentration of activities in communities like Roxbury. And I wonder, when you talk about that, are you talking about those communities as both a point of sale and use, or just as a point of sale? What, what I'm concerned about is we don't have much discussion about the use outside of those communities and where the demand is coming from, which is the suburbs, yeah. because the yeah. pictures are so easy to get in the inner cities. Uh, so if you could speak to this. Well, I, I can't tell you any more than any, <clears throat> any good detective uh, will, will tell you that uh, um, you can, you know, there are techniques for, uh, for working at that. Uh, you know, you, you rest. Uh, you impound automobiles and so forth. Uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, the the most destructive social patterns occur in those sites. I mean, what goes on in Walden Pond afterwards? I don't know, and don't much, and, 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 and it doesn't much matter. I mean, if you fight. Um, the um, uh, there's an avoidance of that concentration. There, there really is, and. Uh, 
and to say, well, yeah, a lot of people in the suburbs drive in and get their stuff and go home. Yeah, fine, they do, and they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't and, and nothing happens. But do they connect their activities to the violence they're causing in the inner cities? I'm sorry? But do they connect their individual activities or no. actions to the violence nope. they're causing in the inner nope. cities? No, they do not. And the media lets them get away with it. And the media is in on the conspiracy. I agree. Uh, Senator Moynihan, uh, as you know, the uh, drug trade has had a terrific impact on countries like Colombia and Peru for cocaine and other countries like Burma on heroin. Um, I don't suppose we're going to have an immediate change in the law. One question I have is what you might do to reduce the impact on those countries. I know one uh, uh, tax all researcher says maybe they could grow the U's that for breast cancer in some of the areas in Peru where they're growing cocaine now. It seems to me that's an important question for the Senate, what you are going to do in the impact in these countries. And my other question is about juveniles. If you legalize uh, drugs, uh, do you put any restriction on sales to minors? Well, I, to answer your first question, your second question, I, I assume, well, I don't, I don't reach that point, so we won't, I mean, I don't want to talk about age distinctions. Uh, on the foreign effects, um, uh, look, you can't, uh, the one thing you, I've, tr I've traveled around the world a fair amount and have pleaded with a fair number of people uh, to watch this stuff in, uh, because there comes a time when the traffic in these substances becomes so profitable that the government can't hold it anymore. And that's happened in, 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 in Colombia. Uh, in Burma, it's the source of a regime, you know. Uh, the Burmese government has a wonderful thing. They invite American legislators to come out and, uh, uh, and set fire to uh, uh, mounts of, uh, they set aside every 10th ton of, like, <laughs> set fire to in this little ceremony. Uh, the, uh, India has a problem, maybe. Uh, India is the source of almost all the licit opium in the world. And uh, if you had my teeth, you wouldn't want to live in a world without, uh, without uh, um, uh, Novocaine, I, I assure you. Uh, and uh, the Indians have, had, have, have kept very careful, very proper uh, accounting of this. They have uh, tiny uh, units, about uh, a tenth of a hectare per uh, producer. Uh, and the, the, contr the control of it goes back to the 1830s. Um, uh, but they're beginning to, mm, you know, it's, it's to so easy to grow. Uh, the, I, I think it's a proposition that the world, has, the world has been doing this for a long time. The Americans have been very active. We had our first opium treaty around 1907. Anybody want to give me a better date on that? Uh, and, hmm? 1909. 1909. Well, that's not bad for an old fellow. Uh, 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 and, you know, it, it doesn't. Uh, what, what we do have is a very regulated traffic in licit opium. The arrangement is that the Indians are produce 80 percent and the Turks 20. But the Turks are finding it's not that productive. It's a very intensive hand labor. Uh, pure opium is against straw, opium straw. You, you do it, you know, the, the amount of capital involved is, uh, is a quarter inch of, of, of iron with which you slice the uh, stamen of the, uh, like this. I mean, it, the, there's no capital involved, and uh, the Indians have that workforce, and it's a productive and sensible uh, product. So to that extent, there is some international regulation, but for purposes of illicit uh, materials, there's none. I think there'll be. Sir. Um, uh, part of what you've been talking about tonight has been uh, the public policy towards uh, what uh, drugs and you seem to take the view that, uh, that the government view should be kind of a paternalistic one. Uh, we know what's right for you, you should do this. Uh, the libertarian point of view is that we own our own bodies, so what we right. put into them or take out of them is our own business, so things like the right to die, abortion, whether we mm -hmm. use drugs or not, is a fairly simple issue. Right. I think our founding fathers were libertarians, but somewhere along the line we became very, very paternalistic. Do you think we're going back the other way? Gosh, that is a good question, and I bet it's debated every day in this building, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and should be. Uh, uh, um, yes, no. I don't know quite how libertarian uh, uh, John Adams really was down deep. 
Jefferson uh, uh, was not there. Uh, he's, uh, does he, is Jefferson a founding father? You have to have been in, uh, at Philadelphia to be a founding father in my, my book. Uh, the, uh, 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 Jay was not a libertarian. Uh, uh, Madison, well, I don't want to get beyond my knowledge. Sir? Were more libertarian back then. Yeah, I mean, there were damn sight fewer laws. I mean, well, you know, uh, one says this is the oath of allegiance. Very simple oath of allegiance. The oath of allegiance goes on and on and on and on. Now you have to uh, defend this constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a one law with the oath of office, got a 10 cent gallon uh, tariff on rum and Jamaica rum, and that was about it for that Congress. Well, no, they also passed the Bill of Rights. I must let me answer that. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, the modern state is much more invasive into the lives of the individual, uh, not least to, uh, 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 to uh, impose a, a health standard. Um, let's see. Um, doctor, help me. Uh, we got a, a, an inoculation for typhus, didn't we, in the 1790s? Napo the Napoleon spread it. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, when the uh, Italians got back there, the prince, the, the dukedoms, got back their uh, 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 sovereignty from Napoleon, the first thing they did, the first thing they stopped is that inoculation business. I mean, let people die the way God meant them to die, not the way the French decide to keep them alive when it's against God's will. Uh, 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 sir, question. one last question. Sir. We all admire your capacity to survive, even though there are so many more laws than there used to be. I teach at the medical school, and I've just been president of the American Psychiatric Association. Oh, yes, sir. So I have some uh, interest in your saying you don't know what the profession wants. Uh, I think, on the whole, you and Congress has been rather on the better side of what the profession wants than the president has for the last 12 years, in that every year except this one, NIMH's funds have been, we've asked for much more. Congress has given us most of what we wanted, <clears throat> much more than what the president wished us to have. So NIMH is one measure. This year happens to be the first year that NIMH is not increasing in absolute funding because their reorganization is in fact costing the money which they're taking out of what otherwise would be research funds. So if you're interested in what the profession wants, I'd be very glad to have our government affairs people be in more in touch with you. Here However, <laughs> I had another point which several questioners pointed to, and I wonder what you think of your emphasis, I think is correct, to be interested as Norm Zinberg was in set and setting involves being interested in teenagers and people who begin using drugs and some teenagers and minority teenagers. If one is interested in them, the Bush-Reagan tack has been punitive rather than treatment. If you genuinely think that treatment is an essential part of catching hold of teenagers, and I think Norm Zinberg would, then I think you ought to be very interested in the question that one of the other questioners asked, which is what about including drug uh, rehab and drug treatment and mental health treatment in any national health plan. I think you're aware that of the 30 major national health insurance plans this last year, not one came within 20 percent of what I would consider adequate mental health or drug treatment. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I, um, uh, uh, doctor, I absolutely agree with you. Um, but I think that um, would I ask, could I ask you, and this is our closing question, just to say the, you know, what we don't know and I'll, we'll, we'll talk on our own, that, that, uh, is <clears throat> um, well, uh, the, the treatment that we're talking about in the main where we can show results is so labor intensive, if I can use that phrase. Uh, how many people present have been to a drug treatment center? Some of us, yeah, a few of us, not many. Uh, the, uh, you have 30 fellows in there, and they're all fouled up. And you have 30 people looking after them. And after maybe 18 months, you begin to get a little flip. Now, am I, I'm, not, I'm not too much exaggerating, am I, doctor? Not at all. I suggest you include prevention, though. I think that's something we need to <coughs> do much more and learn much more. We can get there. 
we would see, because treatment is, <clears throat> uh, it, I don't want to say it's beyond the resources of the society, but the, the, our society will not put up the resources that we would require for that, that kind of one-on-one -on -one treatment. Uh, it is too many people. You're talking about five million people. Uh, uh, so, uh, the cost of not doing it is also great. Is a bitch. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I spoke to you about the iron incompatibilities of choices here. Uh, and I, but I do think it has something. Does it, do I get any resonance, resonance about the impact of technology? You have a feeling that technology you know, gave us something. Oh, God, did we have to get that? You know. Um, but you're working on it. Um, I think that uh, you know there's some enzyme work that's coming along, and I think you are finding you can split enzymes, but you don't know if you split these, what other enzymes you'll be splitting, and you have to be doctors, and you have to be very careful, and you are. Um, I just think, uh, but if you could tell me, if you could give me, uh, just to help me, doctor, what do you mean by prevention? You are the sub committee chairman on a treatment on families, I think genuine work on families and on uh, giving children a lot of other things that are meaningful in their lives is terrific prevention and works very well around the world and has worked very well in this country too. Yeah. I don't think that just say no is a drop in anybody's bucket, but I think that genuinely to work at having every child born be a wanted child would be very useful, for instance. <laughs> But, but, doctor, I came here seven years ago, and I gave the God, Godkin lectures, and I said, we don't know how to do that either. <laughs> uh, but we're, you're asking the right questions, and uh, so you wouldn't mind my having concluded that paper by saying, really, what we're dealing out with is a fallout of the dramatic change in family structure. I think that is one of the large factors, and we do know a lot about that. Well, we, 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 you will write me that letter, too. <laughs> and thank you very much. You couldn't have been more generous. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Senator, and good evening, everyone.